Blood has always been regarded as a very special fluid. Even in early times, the life-preserving powers of blood were used for treating disease. The idea of improving a person's health by exchanging their blood first emerged in the 16th century. The discovery by William Harvey in 1616 of the circulation of the blood was a major step towards blood transfusions. Harvey didn't perform any transfusion experiments himself, but he did advance the idea of injecting medicines and foreign blood directly into the circulatory system. An Oxford physician called Richard Lower had been injecting different liquids into the veins of living animals for some time. Now he wanted to find out if the blood from one animal was also compatible with that from another. In 1666, using two dogs, Lower performed the first successful blood transfusion. He continued his experiment until the donor dog died. The recipient dog is said to have recovered from its ordeal. But the idea of performing blood transfusions on human beings met with scepticism, because bloodletting was still regarded as the universal remedy for disease. It was even prescribed when the patient's body was already weakened. There seems to be no other plausible reason for the initial reservation shown by doctors towards blood transfusions. But a physician from Montpellier refused to be discouraged. Like Richard Lower, Jean-Baptiste Denis had already carried out successful tests on dogs. In 1667, Denis was presented with a favourable opportunity to experiment on a human subject. Because of excessive bloodletting, a young man was already in a critical state. The donor was a lamb. The patient received around half a litre of blood. It was more by chance that he survived the ordeal. In those days, there were some odd ideas about the importance of blood for the human body. This is shown by the great hopes that were placed in transfusions. Some physicians thought they could even transfer characteristics along with blood. In the years that followed, further experiments were carried out, including transfusions with human blood. But many a transfusion proved fatal, which merely convinced skeptics that they were right. In view of such failures, the ideological and religious objections to blood transfusions seem quite understandable. In 1675, blood transfusions were banned in France, an example soon followed in other countries. It wasn't until 1825, a century and a half later, that London gynaecologist James Blundell performed the first successful transfusions with human blood. A woman who'd just had a child and was hemorrhaging badly was given around a quarter of a litre of fresh blood straight from the arm of an assistant, a successful transfusion that caused a sensation. But problems still arose. Only about 50% of blood transfusions produced the right result, and doctors still didn't know what determined success or failure. Vienna, around the turn of the century. 75 years after Blundell's experiment, Karl Landsteiner discovered the human blood groups and thus solved the riddle of why some blood transfusions gave rise to complications. In 1893, after completing his medical studies, Landsteiner became an assistant doctor at the Department of Hygiene at the University in Vienna, his hometown. It was here that Landsteiner developed an interest in serology and immunology. 
From 1897 to 1908, he worked as a research assistant at the Vienna Pathological Institute, supervising more than 3,600 autopsies. In the course of his serological experiments, Landsteiner discovered that the serum and blood from different people sometimes agglutinate. They clump together. In order to find out why, in 1901, he carried out a number of experiments. First of all, on just six people, himself and other members of the Institute. In preparing the blood for his experiments, Landsteiner removed the clotting factors and then, using a centrifuge, separated the clear blood serum from the formed elements, as they're known, the blood corpuscles. It's the red corpuscles which give blood its colour. He tested each serum against red blood corpuscles suspended in a saline solution. In some cases, the blood corpuscles agglutinated, they clumped together. But in others, the serum and the suspension of blood corpuscles were compatible. The various blood samples seem to have specific characteristics, which meant that only in certain cases can the blood of two different people be mixed. Other experiments with blood from a total of 22 healthy persons confirm that the incompatibility reaction is attributable to a characteristic of the blood itself. In all, Landsteiner was able to identify three different types of blood, which he labelled A, B and C. C was later changed to O. But Landsteiner suspected that he might not have discovered every blood group. So he gave two of his assistants the task of experimenting with the blood from a larger number of people. And indeed, in 1902, a fourth blood group was identified. At first it remained nameless, but was later called AB. At first, several systems were used for describing the various blood groups. Then, in 1928, it was agreed that the four types would be universally referred to as A, B, AB and O. Blood separates into blood serum and red corpuscles which settle. Red corpuscles in blood group A have A antigens on the surface of their cells. The blood serum contains antibodies against B antigens. They're known for short as anti-Bs. Blood corpuscles in blood group B have B antigens. The blood serum contains antibodies against A antigens. They're known as anti-As. If blood groups A and B come into contact, anti-A antibodies react with A antigens. Anti-B antibodies with B antigens. The blood corpuscles clump together. This incompatibility reaction can result in serious organic damage, even death. Following identification of the four main blood groups, many lives could have been saved if, in the case of major blood loss, suitable donor blood from a compatible group had been transfused. However, the response to Landsteiner's discovery was rather muted. So it was only towards the end of World War I that the value of blood transfusions preceded, of course, by the requisite serological tests for blood group determination, was recognised. It was now possible to carry out blood transfusions on a larger scale. This had a major influence on surgery, for it meant that operations could also be performed which involved a major loss of blood. But the biggest impetus to the transfusion of blood came from the addition of anticoagulants and later through the discovery that blood can be kept transfusable for several weeks through the addition of glucose and storage at four degrees Celsius. In World War II, 
blood transfusions were given routinely on a major scale for the first time. In 1922, the poor research conditions in Austria forced Karl Landsteiner to emigrate to the United States. He continued his research at the Rockefeller Institute in New York. In 1930, he received the Nobel Prize for Medicine for his discovery of the human blood groups. But not all the problems associated with blood transfusions had been solved. Although the blood group of donor and recipient was now taken into consideration, complications still occurred. Up until 1940, doctors couldn't understand why. Closer analysis of the unexpected reactions showed that they always occurred when the patient had had a previous transfusion or in women who'd recently given birth. In 1940, Karl Landsteiner and his colleague Alexander Wiener identified the blood factor responsible for these reactions in experiments with rhesus monkeys, hence the term rhesus factor. Like antigens A and B in the ABO system, the rhesus factor involves an antigen on the surface of the red corpuscle cells. Some people with this antigen are described as being rhesus positive, others as rhesus negative. If rhesus positive blood gets into the bloodstream of a rhesus negative person, antibodies are formed against the rhesus antigen. The red corpuscles clump together. In the case of a rhesus birth, as it's known, the mother is rhesus negative, her child rhesus positive. During the birth of the first child, blood corpuscles from the child get into the bloodstream of the mother. She forms antibodies against the rhesus antigen. A second pregnancy can produce a dangerous defensive reaction. In addition to a purely medical application, the blood grouping system is important in another way. For the first time, it enabled the laws of heredity discovered by Augustinian monk Gregor Mendel through studying plants to be confirmed in the case of human beings too. Like other physical characteristics, the blood group and rhesus factor are passed on from parents to children in line with the Mendelian laws. So, blood group determination is also used as a tool in forensic medicine. It's applied in particular in paternity suits to assess whether a man could be the father of a child or not. Blood group analyses are also important for solving violent crimes, although today this task is performed far more effectively by means of genetic tests. The genetic pattern serves as a fingerprint for scientists and criminologists. Today, blood is routinely examined for up to three blood group systems. Blood transfusions are now standard practice, and they have saved many lives. But without large numbers of blood donors, this wouldn't be possible. Blood of all groups is kept in store in a deep frozen state. When needed, it can be thawed out and transfused. Emergency medical care would be inconceivable without blood banks. The discovery of human blood groups finally solved the centuries-old riddle of unsuccessful blood transfusions. Today, blood group tests are largely automated. Within a short time, machines carry out tests which used to take days. The principle behind these tests was developed nearly a hundred years ago by Karl Landsteiner.